welcome. My name is Shante Jackson. I am the executive director of the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. Do folks know what this building used to be before I introduce folks that are with me? Who said no? The location that we are in right now, while it is the new building for Challenge to Change, and we'll hear from Uncle T in a minute, uh, used to be our McKeldry Park Safe Street site. I cannot tell you all how personally grateful I am, and I've shared this with, with Terry and his team members, that we were able to maintain this space as a community space, as a hub, as a mecca for our young people to continue to come into and to get the love and the support and the care that they need and that they deserve. So thank you very much, Uncle C, for taking on this space and turning it into something that I never would have imagined that it would become. And you and I already had a conversation this morning, you can't cry because I don't wanna cry. <laughs> All right. So um, I will be very transparent in saying that I was not prepared to announce everyone who is standing with me. That was the mayor's job. <laughs> so I'm going to hopefully not forget folks. Um, I'm joined today, obviously, by members of the city administration, by our CVI partners, um, by um, our hospital based partners, um, by members of Monsi's team who are responsible for the execution of the CVI work. Um, by Uncle T, by Councilman Glover, thank you for having us in your district, by Dr. Santalisis, by Dr. DeRasa and Dr. Brooks, along with other community members. So good afternoon to everybody that's standing here with us and who is here with us today, all of you who live and work and play in the city that we love. Um, Mayor Scott is going to be talking to you all about a lot when he comes in, but I'm going to say that there is even a lot more to say, so I'm going to say that part. <laughs> Baltimore, we have been working. And rest assured that we will not stop working until our city is free of the disease that is gun violence. Over the last year, we've cultivated, nurtured, and invested in over 44 partnerships that make up Baltimore's first CVI ecosystem. And let me say that that number continues to grow. Mayor Scott's commitment in the Comprehensive Violence Prevention Plan was to establish 30 CVI contracts and Monsi has awarded 44 CVI contracts to date. We have invested $7.3 million in competitive and directly selected grants to organizations who are playing a role in Baltimore's CVI ecosystem, including $2.5 million across eight contracts to CVI ecosystem partners, $225,000 in three contracts for coordinated neighborhood stabilization response partners, $3 million across eight contracts for victim services support, and $1.5 million across 19 contracts for youth and trauma support. Many of these dollars have helped us to co-produce public safety with the folks that are on the ground and those who have been doing this work for many years, like Uncle T. Baltimore is a resource-rich city, but the organizations offering the resources haven't always received the investment that they've needed to make change as a part of an impact that residents really needed to feel and um, yield what real healing would mean for them so that they can make some life-saving changes. We're grateful for the ARPA investment made by Mayor Scott, um, and we've been proud to partner with the Mayor's Office of Recovery Programs to get these dollars in the hands of our community-based partners and our organizations and ultimately to the residents that they serve. These dollars haven't just been reserved for our competitive grant allocations. They've also helped us establish much of our CVI programming, including hospital-based violence intervention programs. This time last year, you heard us commit to establishing stronger partnerships and coordination with Baltimore area hospital partners, making a connection and providing immediate support to gunshot victims in hospitals because it's essential to preventing retaliation and re-victimization. Following the convening of chief medical officers from all area hospitals to discuss the vision for hospital-based responder programs as a part of Baltimore's CVI ecosystem, we became partners with the University of Maryland Medical System, LifeBridge Health, 
MedStar Health, Ascension St. Agnes, and Johns Hopkins Medicine. They've all joined us by providing hospital-based responder programming, and we look forward to bringing these contracts to the Board of Estimates in the coming weeks. Integrating Baltimore's hospital network into the CVI ecosystem has already yielded us great work, including the Public Safety Partnership Work Group around victim services and the upcoming Break the Cycle of Violence Summit that's happening in June. It's a convening of area hospitals led by Johns Hopkins in collaboration with the Center for Gun Violence at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. During that meeting, one of the things that our hospital-based partners will be doing for the first time is coming together to discuss their programs and the actions that are underway to curb violence in our city. In addition to hospital programming, we've also secured over $1 million to get our school-based intervention pilot program up and running, which includes a $700,000 grant from the National League of Cities and an over $300,000 investment from the governor's office. A five-year review of the Child Fatality Review Report from 2016 to 2020 showed us that homicide was the leading cause of child fatality in our city, with 45 young people aged 7 to 17 killed by a non-relative and 24 children from birth to age 7 killed by a parent or a caregiver. 16 and 17-year-old Young people struggling in school and involved in juvenile justice systems were one of the largest groups of that population. Violence is a disease. It's a disease that's transmitted in a cycle. And it is on us as a community to break the cycle. We are proud to partner with the school system that recognizes that development and cultivation of emotional intelligence saves our children's lives. We're currently in the implementation phase of the school-based program focused on hiring school-based intervention specialists and program supervisors. We're gonna be ready for a full launch in time for the start of the 23-24 school year. As we work to integrate the mayor's dual approaches to public safety, that community violence intervention and focused deterrence aspects throughout our city, Monsi's working to bring these integrated elements into three pilot schools ahead of program launch. What that means is that we're introducing community moral voice partners, service partners like Rat, Yap and Roca, I combined those two names, I made them a Brangelina there in a second, um, to identify at risk and potentially group involved young people in schools and to offer them the supports that they need to walk away from violence. These efforts are also paired with our $234,000 investment in social emotional learning and development to community-based organizations. St. Francis Neighborhood Center is going to be serving students in Reservoir Hill and Penn North, and B Theory will be serving students in Harlem Park. It also includes our pre and post youth diversion work to limit our young people's interaction with the justice system and to mitigate recidivism amongst our young people. So I think that we've clearly demonstrated that the administration is prioritizing the success and the promise of our young people. This is what we mean when we say that this is an ecosystem and that it has to be integrated in a truly comprehensive way to save lives and to change futures every single day. The work is ever evolving. Let's talk about safe streets. So remember before Mayor Scott's investment, Safe Streets had been the centerpiece of Baltimore's CVI landscape. And while the program continues to be an anchor, a literal anchor and a lifeline in our communities across the city, Baltimore hasn't always poured back into the program to take care of our violence interrupters. From the beginning, we've been very clear that this administration would work to strengthen and professionalize the program, which included a new operating model for Safe Streets and the commissioning of an external evaluation on the effectiveness of the program. Dr. Daniel Webster of Johns Hopkins publicly shared his evaluation just a few short weeks ago, and he found that the weighted average of program effects across all of our sites estimated a statistically significant 23% reduction in shootings associated with program implementation. His study estimated that across all 10 sites, violence interrupters prevented three shootings 
every year, one fatal and two non-fatal per site per year when compared to similar areas in the city where there is no safe street site. He also suggested that the social and economic benefits of safe streets yield us $7.2 to $19.2 dollars per every dollar spent in the program. So despite the narrative that we continue to see from some that attempt to discredit the incredible and life-saving work of our frontline workers, we've delivered externally validated proof that this program works. This administration is supporting this work like never before. And to that end, Monty will invest ARPA dollars in Safe Streets administration for the first time of $5 million. This is in addition to the funding that is already a part of the general funds budget and the dollars that the, the governor's office provides Safe Streets. Dr. Webster has proven that this program is effective and underinvested in. The $5 million is going to support the operations associated with the fiscal year 23 through fiscal year 25 Safe Streets contracts. But know that this further investment will also be coupled with a more public facing and robust data tracking and reporting system, which is also something that we committed to so that Baltimore can follow our progress. I'm proud to announce that in partnership with Administrators Catholic Charities and LifeBridge Health, Monty will be producing quarterly and annual Safe Streets reports hosted on Monty's website at monty.baltimorecity.gov that track data across all of our 10 sites, including non-fatal shootings, firearm homicides, violent crime, property crime, mediations, and so much more. And because we know that it takes an understanding of the root cause of violence to truly address it in a sustainable way, our team is also tracking and sharing the most common reasons for conflicts to inform how we approach our integrated intervention and deterrence. Baltimoreans will also be able to see the outcomes of mediations you hear us talk about. We know that when there's conflict, the solution is not always instantaneous. While potential violence is prevented in the moment, it could take parties months and months to find reconciliation. And you'll see that in the report. You will see that our violence interrupters are relentless in making sure that mediations come to a mutually agreed upon a conclusion. Because of the sheer credibility of our frontline staff, we're able to report on the status of conflict by if it's ongoing, temporarily resolved or fully resolved. We're also excited to announce that reporting is going to be available for our hospital-based partners and other CVI programming starting in July of this year. While Safe Streets isn't responsible for reducing all violent crime and property crime, what we do know to be true is that in this first quarter, from January 2023 through March 2023, Homicides are down 75%. Violent crime is down 67%. And property crime is down 67% across our 10 catchment zones year over year. Baltimore, this is representative of the commitment that the mayor made to strengthen this program. These are the direct results of investing in this program through formalized training, uh, completed by our staff in November and December of last year, filling staff vacancies and unifying operations across all 10 sites under two administrators that make up the mo almost every component of the CVI ecosystem, including victim services, hospital-based violence intervention programming, community outreach, life coaching, and mediation and violence intervention. The ROI, and when I say ROI, I mean results, I mean outcomes, I mean impacts, are real, undeniably real. So the mayor's commitment to violence reduction is coming to fruition right before our eyes. We're coordinating and shifting our strategy from past efforts that involved incomplete, disparate, and one-off efforts and initiatives. 
With that said, we must continue to do this work together. There is no other city better than Baltimore to demonstrate what the proof of a fully integrated community, a connected village can accomplish. It's gonna take all of us, from community-based organizations, to medical systems, to our schools, to municipal agencies, to the residents that live here, to folks that are here to work, to folks that are here to play to truly co-produce public safety across Baltimore. It's gonna take the entire weight of the city. At this point, the mayor is here. I will turn it over to him um, and we'll continue our program from there. Sir, when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Director. Good morning and thank you all for being here. Uh, one year ago, I stood alongside many of the folks standing with me today and those in the room uh, to announce the vision uh, that we have for Baltimore's first ever community violence intervention ecosystem. One that connects uh, these one-off efforts that you heard from the director, bridges the gap, prioritizes health and well-being of Baltimoreans, and takes a trauma-informed approach uh, to trying to cure Baltimore of its longest standing public health challenge, which is gun violence. And I'm proud to say, as you heard, one year later, our CVI partnerships run deeper than they ever have in the city of Baltimore. While some of the faces uh, you see might be new to the ecosystem, they are not new to the most important part of Baltimore, and that's the community. They are staples and the voices of our communities that have served in their communities for decades without funding or any help from the city of Baltimore. Folks that I knew uh, the, that needed the city to tap, to truly tap in and to take a community-based approach to violence prevention and reduction. And I want to uh, recognize and thank uh, this group of folks for their dedication that they have made to all Baltimoreans in the co-production of public safety in this city. Uh, because not one person, not one organization, not one entity, not one school, not one community organization can do public safety in Baltimore the correct way alone. We're going to start uh, with my uncle and everybody's uncle in Baltimore, Uncle T, from Challenge to Change, who is graciously hosting us today in his brand new facility. Our Safe Streets Baltimore family, Catholic Charities, our hospital partners, Lightbridge, University Medical System, MedStar Health, Sinai, and Bon Secours, Roar, uh, We Are Us, Turnaround Inc., uh, Wells Fargo Philanthropy, the University of Maryland School of Social Work, uh, the National League of Cities, and our first ever CVI Advisory Board, who I will introduce shortly. I would like to also uh, recognize our government-based partners, including Director Jackson, who you've heard from, uh, who has taken this office, the Mayor's Office of, of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, and shown how we can be a beacon of example for what we can do from government to really co-produce public safety. And now that example is being duplicated around, around the country. Councilman Glover, who is hosting us, thank you, sir, for allowing me in the 13th District today. Uh, Deputy Mayor Dr. Jaraza, first time I got to say that. <laughs> Dr. Deborah Books, who leads the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success, and our Police Commissioner Michael Harrison. Uh, we, my entire administration, and everyone here in Baltimore, who's a part of this work in Baltimore, are committed and determined more than ever to address the violence on our streets for the public health endemic that it is. As many of you recall, in 2020, under my leadership as then city council president, seems like five or six, seven years ago now, and prior to the establishment of Monsey, the Baltimore City Health Department was charged with developing a biannual uh, comprehensive violence prevention framework and plan that would take a public health approach to reducing violence in Baltimore. At this direction, then Health Commissioner Dr. DeRaza convened the Citywide Violence Prevention Task Force 
uh, comprised of local agencies and organizations, state agencies, federal government technical assistance partners to develop that framework uh, rooted in a public health approach and equitable life outcomes for all Baltimore's residents and visitors. I also like to uh, acknowledge um, my good friend and our partner, Dr. Santalisis from Baltimore City Schools. Uh, the framework uh, begun by Dr. Terraza and her team was the foundation of what we all now know as Baltimore's Comprehensive Violence Prevention Plan. We created an all-hands-on-deck strategy around community center and collaborative solutions that address the violence while strengthening ties into the community. We invested, as you know, $50 million to accelerate the development of our violence prevention work and support the organizations uh, operating on the front lines to build a safer Baltimore. A public health approach to reducing violence requires co-production and unforeseen levels of coordination. Too often in our neighborhoods, interpersonal conflict uh, escalates into cruel and deadly behavior. We know that this is not something that we can police our way out of. We know that when we are literally seeing people be killed by people that they will call their friend over something so small. The responsibility uh, to prevent violence falls on all of us, not just one person or one agency. Approaching violence reduction through a lens of public health means strengthening our strategy that simultaneously unearths the root causes of violence and utilizes violence intervention programming like Safe Streets, hospital-based responder programs, community-based organization, and even school-based violence intervention programs. More simply put, we have to do every, any, and everything, and we have to do it together. The folks that stand here today have made a great commitment to join these efforts and offer their services that will reach victims and perpetrators alike to help disrupt the circles of violence we continue to see play out in our communities. Last year, when we unveiled this vision for Baltimore's CVI ecosystem, uh, I committed to redefining and building on Baltimore's existing conflict mediation and violence intervention programming, developing stronger partnerships and coordination with our area hospital partners, expanding intensive life coaching services, and for the first time ever, focusing on victim services. As you heard me say before, I have no earthly idea how until last year gunshot victims in Baltimore weren't offered victim services, but we corrected that uh, wrong, and that's not the word I want to use, but that's the wrong that we were able to correct. And I'm proud to say that all of these efforts are underway, if not completed, in partnership with Baltimore and for Baltimore. A while uh, I let Dr. Jackson and a few of our ecosystem partners provide the majority of the updates. I want to hone in on two. Uh, as a city, even as we stand here today uh, with a year-over-year 19% reduction in homicides and 18% reduction in, in non-fatal shootings, we are still losing way too many people to violence, but more specifically, young people. And when we think about the factors that contribute to violence among young people, a lack of social emotional development, emotional regulation, emotional intelligence, and peaceful conflict resolution skills are at the forefront. In September, we announced our school-based violence intervention program that will be launched in three of our city schools that experienced the most violence, Mervo, Carver, and Digital Harbor. My administration is proud to further partner with Catholic Charities to administer this program under the direction of Monsi to implement programming that will equip our youth with life-saving tools to resolve their conflicts in ways that do not cause harm physically or emotionally. Uh, and these are life skills that they will carry forward with them through the rest of their life journey. Under my direction, Monsi is also working to establish a safe passage program in partnership with my Office of Children and Family Success Maryland State Transit Police to see uh, that young people make it to and from school safely and again bring uh, community-based conflict resolution directly to them. And before I turn it back over to Director Jackson, I want to announce a group of people who will help advise and oversee uh, the work that is underway on our CVI ecosystem. And as committed, uh, Monsi has developed and convened uh, this first ever group. 
The members of the board are people of the community. They are foundation members, business owners, nonprofit managers, returning citizens, and community, community leaders. And I want to announce these folks and say that we're going to give them a round of applause once we finish. Uh, Carlita Brown, Aisha Burgess, John Kamick, Bob Embry, who I know just had to leave, uh, Simon Fitzgerald, Sarah Heminger, Donald Mannequin, Jane Miller, Will, William Moore, Sean Robinson, and Larry S Simmons. Let's give them a round of applause. And this group has been charged with uh, providing high quality guidance to my administration as we continue to develop, implement, and scale this ecosystem. We have made a lot of progress, but I want to be very clear. There is much, much more progress to be made. And the only way uh, that we can do that is together. Curing Baltimore's violence is my top responsibility and priority as mayor. And I look forward to continue to invest in these partnerships and this ecosystem that is helping us build safer neighborhoods today, but also will help us achieve sustainable reductions in violence over time. And with that, I'll turn it over to Director Jackson. Thank you, sir. Before we uh, ask the next speaker to come up, I do want to um, specifically introduce folks to someone uh, standing to the right of me whose job it is to um, own the management of the CBI ecosystem. It's cultivation, making sure that we're measuring um, the right key performance indicators, but also that we're measuring impact to people's lives, that we are leaning into the work that Dr. DeRosa and so many others did before Monty was even created around driving to real results, outcomes, and impacts for um, folks that live in Baltimore City, for our young people um, to reach the best versions of themselves. Crystal Miller is the deputy director of the CVI um, work that we do within Monsey. And I would offer to those of you that have not gotten to know her yet, you should. At this point, I'll turn it over to our hospital partner, Dr. Lucas Carlson, who's the medical director um, for care transformation for Baltimore City at MedStar Health to talk more about their role in the ecosystem. Doctor, when you're ready. Well, thank you very much, Mayor Scott and Director Jackson and the entire team here for the opportunity to speak today and for bringing this group together. Um, at MedStar Health, we are honored to partner with the city and local area hospitals to help support the vision of the vision to reduce uh, violence and promote safer communities across Baltimore. Violence is more than just a criminal justice issue. It's a matter of public health, as you heard here earlier today. And it influences impacts the lives and the well-being of all of us. As we are all too familiar, in Baltimore, there have been more than 300 homicides annually since 2015, with a majority of these as a result of gun violence. But in public health, there's a saying that statistics are merely human beings with the tears wiped away. These numbers represent lives lost and families shattered. And as an emergency room physician, this is something I'm all too familiar with. The health toll of violence goes beyond that which surgery can repair, and it doesn't end when the patient is discharged from the hospital. We see it in the patient's faces, the wounds we repair, the friend at the bedside, the dis discouraged nurse that's going home beaten down after a shift of, endless, of needless trauma, and most of all, in the phone call you have to make to a mother after you've done everything that you could. We know the sequelae of this trauma. Injuries, disability, PTSD, depression, and the impacts on chronic, uh, chronic conditions such as cardiovascular disease. And this is why the work of the community violence intervention ecosystem is so crucial. We believe that we have the capacity to interrupt the cycle of violence and that addressing it requires this public health approach. And MedStar Health Hospitals and hospital systems across the city we have ED-based uh, violence responders to serve as a key part of the CVI ecosystem, providing trauma-informed trauma care to perpetrators and victims of violence to help break that cycle. We believe that by addressing these root causes of violence 
and providing support to those affected by it. We can work towards a future where violence no longer permeates our ERs and communities. Our work is, our work is far from done, but the progress made by the CBI ecosystem to date is encouraging and is worth celebrating. As you heard here earlier today, since the program's inceptions, this comprehensive approach and the hospital-based violence responders have demonstrated uh, significant reductions in violence as well as improvement in health outcomes across the city. These programs are working, and we need to continue to support and to expand on them. We are proud to partner with the mayor, uh, the mayor's office, and the city of Baltimore in this effort, and believe that through this work, we will be able to improve the well-being of our communities and work towards a safer, more peaceful Baltimore. Thank you all very much. Next, we'll turn it over to Uncle T. First and foremost, I dare not give God his praises. I dare not do that. So I thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ had it not been for him and my strong supportive soulmate, my rib, my everything, my boo, my baby, <laughs> and my children. This would not have been possible. I came when I was sitting over and I was thinking, man, all these people in here probably got more degrees than a thermometer. <laughs> and I said to myself, I said, wow. I said, how do I contend with this? But God has a way of humbling us and having us to be thankful to be in the midst of such great people. So I am thankful to the mayor, to the commissioner, I was saying to the commission out front, I'll be brief with this, I said, man, me and my wife and the church home, we pray for y'all minds and hearts every day. Because even in this instance, God forbid, they could get a call that a 13 or 12 or 11 year old is staying in our seat streets and sidewalks with their blood. And so I say to myself, God, what your eyes has witnessed, and with your ears have heard, you are in our constant prayer. And, and Ms. Santalisa, Ms. Jackson, I thank y'all for the awesome work that y'all are doing, despite what others say on the contrary. So uh, I just want to speak to the fact that I am again grateful. I do not take this moment lightly at all. Um, this is a hard work. Sometimes we make it hard work, but this is really a hard work. And when your heart is in it, when your heart is in it, Jude 22 say, there are those that have compassion. They are the ones that make a difference. And they do not going or mind going into fiery places to capture like a fireman, to drag a child out and save them. And that's the heartbeat of challenge to change. And when you take the LLE out of challenge, you left with the word change. And we believe that change can come out of any challenge. So challenge to change is this not a program. Challenge to change is our city. We are challenging our city in every level. Every government official, every clergyman, every leader, every businessman, as the mayor said, this all a part of the ecosystem. So CVI ecosystem is real. We have over 80,000 children in our public school. And this summer alone, I think about the Harbor Place and some of the things that we see take place down there with our youth. And let me say this before getting into my, that, that thought, traveling that thought. Parents, parents, please watch your children. Know what they're getting into. Do you know your, you think you know your children. Just like me, my wife, we thought we knew ours. And as y'all leave down them steps, you will see my son hanging on that wall because he's lost his life to gun violence. Because I wasn't there. Because my father wasn't there. But I asked God, if you give me a chance, I will reverse this curse. And thank God that I have a son today we raised correctly in college right now, go to Savannah, Georgia. 
And that's why I know it can be reversed. I don't care how crippled, tattered, and torn you are. You put in the work with that individual. And I can assure you, if it's hard work, it will work. If it's hard work, it will work. Because you'll do what you have to do to get the job done. Sleepless nights and all. I ain't know nothing about no prenatal care. I rub my wife's stomach. I'm praying, little, I'm reading little children books. <laughs> I'm saying, you're going to be great. <laughs> Him and my daughter, y'all going to be great. We kept them in private schools. and Not that that was, you know, it had its challenges too, right? <laughs> but they never been involved in the, in the justice system. My young daughter goes to booing. I never dreamed imaginable that these things can happen. But I know that those that have been broken and tattered and torn the greatest, God used them to become the master menders of other broken people. So that I am grateful for. So I don't take this like this environment. I don't know what you felt when you came in here, but this is love. This is the express image of agape. So when these children come into a new environment, truly believe this. If they see something different, they will do something different. If they see something different, they would do something different. And I goes into the homes and, 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 and see the kids, how they live in some of the deplorable conditions and same conditions I came up in. That's why I know this situation is fixable. With the right minds bombarding the mind of that broken person, change can happen. And I'm not going to drag this out because we have distinguished guests going to come before you and get statistics. And, and, and I'm not a data man, but thank God we got four interns from John Hawkins Hospital <laughs> going to help us with some data because I was told that paperwork make the paperwork. <laughs> so go so I, I know statistics are real. I know statistics are real. Again, I can't do this without y'all. We, we just ask that y'all continue to play y'all part as we play out. Last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Dr. Santa Lisas and then we'll turn it over to the mayor for questions. Okay, I just have to say something to go after <laughs> Uncle T. Are you kidding me? So I will, I will say this, right? So I had all the prepared statistics and all of that, um, but it's not really necessary, except to say that the power of this work is the fact that it is a community coming together to solve our own problems. It is about realizing that it is not at any one agency's, not any one person's doorstep. And you, heur you heard a lot um, from Director Jackson and the mayor about what is coming in schools, and yes, that is important. But I, I also need to say that they did not wait for the official grant to begin. And I think that's really important because it speaks to the heart of the work that CDI represents. So what Director Jackson, what Dr. Brooks could have said was the grant doesn't begin until September, so if anything else happens, you guys are kind of on your own until it begins officially. That is not what they said. They said in a season of unprecedented, and I will say a winter that is unlike any winter in my entire career. And I have spent the majority of my career serving urban school districts and the majority of that here in Baltimore City. We have had a winter like none we have ever had when it comes to young people who have been slain, whose lives have been taken from violence. But within that despair, the thread, the golden thread, has been the community response and the community standing up through as represented by CVI and saying these are all of our children. They are not one person's child and then when they come to the school do schoolhouse door they become someone else's. They are all ours. And I will also tell you that one of the secret, when people talk about secret sauce, my husband's an entrepreneur and he's always like, what's your secret sauce, baby? You gotta have a secret sauce. Our secret sauce within CVI is the kind of collaboration that you see here today. Teachers, principals, educators often feel like 
they are the ones that are supposed to take care of everything when it comes to children. But what you see in this effort within Baltimore that is a special sauce is that you see large numbers of people bringing their expertise, whether it's the relationships that Uncle T brings or whether it's the statistics that the Hopkins undergrads will bring or grad students, I don't know which ones, right, are gonna bring or whether it is the, the, the just the everyday neighbors, the people who have been doing this work for years actually interfacing with institutions. That's what makes the difference here. And for me, I stand proud to stand with my partners in the city, my partners in the community, and frankly, those who have cared for our young people long before some of us were standing here. And I will end with this, that in city schools, we have said that it is about educating whole children. It's not just what your test score is, and yes, that matters. It is not just about where you are on one day. It is about seeing you in the full trajectory of who you are destined to be. And so it is within this space that CVI comes alongside us as the school system to say there are many resources that we all bring together. And I will tell you as a final that when I came in, Uncle T, was showing me all the different rooms in this space. And he took me to the dance studio. I don't know why he thought that would be my favorite, but he must have known. <laughs> went to the dance studio. We went to the gaming section. We went to the entrepreneur area. And this center actually represents the same spirit of CVI that says it's not just one thing. It's not just one part of a young person's life. It is the ability to bring it all together and to have whole people so that we have whole families and we have whole communities and we have a whole Baltimore. Thank you for the privilege of partnering. Thank you, Dr. S and everyone. Now we'll take questions. And because of time, we'll only do two questions per outlet. Um, let's start on the left. So Mackenzie or Ken, either one of you. Ken, you can go first. Um, Mr. Mayor, yes. the city has had 300 plus homicides in the past eight years. Are you confident that number will come down this year? The numbers are trending in the right way. You feel confident that's going to happen this year? I, I'm confident that we will continue to work each and every day. Uh, you hear from all the folks here. Uh, we know that right now, as you and I are talking, we're talking about a 19% reduction in non-fatal in homicides and an 18% reduction in non-fatal shootings. We want to expand that. We want that percentage to grow in the right direction. And that's what we're going to work towards every day from a standpoint of doing the both and, from our CVI work that includes the totalness of what we're trying to do to reduce violent crime. We're going to do our best each and every day, all of us, no matter what is happening in the city of Baltimore. And just to follow up, um, with the scale of, of GBRS, uh, even, you know, the commissioner was at uh, a consent decree hearing recently saying uh, the judge had doubt that it could be achieved uh, without enough police in place. I mean, they're not, it's, it's an integral part of this uh, plan. Do you feel confident that by mid-2024, with the scale of GVRS? Yes, I'm, I'm very confident that we're going to be able to move GVRS as we're continuing to move in the right direction. We've already expanded into another district. GVRS is a, a working program that we're going to continue to expand in Baltimore City, period. Mackenzie? Hello. Good. A um, couple questions about the way that the Safe Streets program, obviously, we've seen some of the contracts that the city has with the various CBOs about it, seen some of the details about how the CBOs spend the money. Does the city or the CBOs have the receipts for the petty cash that each location has and how that money is spent? We'll follow up with you. We, we know that these, these programs, again, McKenzie, that have been proven not by us and, and analyzed not by the city of Baltimore, independently by Johns Hopkins, one of the most prestigious and well-respected institutions in the world to say that this program works. And that's what we should be talking about today. This program saves lives in Baltimore City, uh, something that we hear consistently that it does not. It's been proven again 
that it reduces homicides and non-fatal shootings in areas in tremendous form and fashion. The Hopkins study also says that there was no significant change in homicides in the six newer program locations for the Safe Streets program. Um, but will you and Director Jackson agree to do an interview with us to talk about this moving forward and how this $5 million will help grow the Safe Streets locations? Well, again, I think that what you should think about about that is, Mackenzie, well, what are you asking for? Interview? Let's, let's, see, let's get that question very clearly. What do you want to interview us about? The success of Safe Streets? I'll talk about the Safe Streets program, yes. You and Director Jackson. We'll get back to you and let you know about that. Why won't you? I didn't say that we wouldn't. Will Next question. Darcy, do you have anything? Brady? Um, yeah, so speak to youth violence specifically. I know we're moving towards the summer and you guys were talking about the curfews and whatnot they're going to have. Um, is there any advancement that you can share with us about what that looks like for the youth? I'll let uh, Deputy Mayor Dr. DeRaza and, and Director Jackson talk a little bit about that uh, right now. So I'll start and, and really echo a lot of what Director Jackson has said, right? This is a co-production um, around public safety. And so Do Director Jackson is the lead on the implementation planning, but everyone up here is a partner and is supporting this work. There will be engagement of community-based organizations who have been on the ground doing this work. Dr. Brooks, Director of Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success, will support overall programming. We'll look to partners around evaluation of effectiveness. And so this is a, a work in progress, but Director Jackson has done a fabulous job in leading this work. Um, and then just my next question. I guess, Director Jackson, we sat down when you guys initially announced the pilot program in the schools that you guys were doing, um, speaking to the youth. I guess you and Dr. Santelis may be able to speak to how has that been within the last year since you know, you launched the pilot program within the schools. What do you see? So I'm going to come back to your um, last question, just to follow on to what we heard Dr. DeRosso say. Um, I want to be really clear in stating that um, the partners that are working on this curfew-related um, project, in um, addition to the summer programming work that we are doing, are not ignorant associated with what the impacts of curfew have had not only in Baltimore City, but also across the country and or not had, which is why what we're producing is going to be just like everything else that this administration has produced, unique, new, cutting edge, and will be copied after. You can quote me on that one. The other thing that I'll mention coming back to uh, your question associated with the schools based work is that we're in the process um, with Associated Catholic Charities, who is here with me somewhere, there he is, um, who is serving as our community-based partner in administering this program. We're hiring individuals right now, as Dr. S. mentioned. We were doing this work long before the grant dollars came in, right? And so while we had this conversation um, some time ago, it was because the work was beginning. We obviously need to fund the work. So we'll be in full swing. Um, in those three schools come the start of this academic year, but we have been in schools regularly, partnering as our um, counterparts need us in Edmondson, in Patterson, in Mervo, in any and every single school that they've asked for partnership in or that we've extended partnership in. Um, that, that's been playing out in very real ways. Um, on the heels of the Patterson incident, this is a demonstration of the effectiveness of the mayor's dual approach to gun violence. It was the first time we actually saw focused deterrence and uh, community violence intervention come together, where we spent time making sure that we were having conversations with young folks who were at the highest risk of either being a victim or a perpetrator and or who we believe were group involved in having intensive conversations and providing wraparound supports to families and know that some families did accept those supports. Dr. S. Oh, thank you, Director Jackson. The only thing I would add that we are already seeing is the ability to have follow-up support that, as you just heard from Director Jackson, is actually preventative in nature. When you're able to identify young people who need the support, families who need the support prior to a conflict exploding, it allows a lot of the incidents that we've seen in these high schools not to spread. 
And so it's both preventative in nature, but it also helps to mitigate what is often the fallout. I mean, and if you talk to principals, one of the things they will tell you is as concerned as they are with one incident, they are concerned with what one incident will actually seed. And so a lot of the partnership already, what we're looking forward to, is that it's not one more thing to be on a school leader's plate or a school leadership team. You have the support, and what we're seeing is really a mitigation of some of those um, corollary um, kinds of conflict that previously we would not have had support for. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think you've kind of begun to answer my question. Um, I, I was wondering if you could just give some more specifics about what parents or students could expect in one of those three schools next um, next fall when that program launches. Uh, good morning, everyone. So what parents and students can expect for the school-based program is having three staff in each of the three schools um, working directly with faculty and staff, working with the students, and intervening when there are conflicts that happen within the school walls, but also being able to prevent those conflicts from bleeding out of the school into neighborhoods that the students are traveling to and from to get to school. We want to reduce the instances of violence coming to the school doors and anything that happens in the schools from traveling outside into neighborhoods. Uh, the program staff will also provide activities and en enrichment activities for youth who have been identified as the highest risk or at risk for being a victim of violence or someone who can engage in violent activity to redirect that energy and that behavior into something more productive and showing them things that they may not have had um, access to previously. It'll be a it's part of the ecosystem as we've talked about a lot here today and working with other programs and partnerships that are part of the ecosystem and being able to communicate what we're seeing happening in the school and neighborhoods to partner with those programs and partnerships um, and working together students will have the opportunity for resources and where there's the need to engage parents um, we will have parent involvement in making sure that students and families are getting the resources they need to again um, prevent violence from happening within the schools and also traveling from neighborhoods into the schools. Thank you, everybody.